And action. Hi, Dr. Robin McKay here. Welcome to your Tuesday morning meeting. This is the most anticipated Tuesday morning meeting of the season because I suspect this is why we're anticipating it. We're talking about the psychology behind salary negotiations, promotions, and raises. And so if you've raised your hand and said that you want more information about that, you want to understand your own psychology around asking for and receiving raises, promotions, and negotiating in your favor, if you're in that process as well, I am so glad you're here. Say hello in the comments if you are here with me live or if you're watching the recording or listening to it anywhere else where we, we send this over to our podcast. And I think this goes on YouTube as well. So wherever you're listening, say hello. And if you are new, then let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Robin McKay. I'm an award-winning psychologist and author. I am an executive coach for primarily women leaders in tech, healthcare, entrepreneurship, and other high-performance fields. I'm a keynote speaker. Uh, and I, this is one of the reasons that I do my work and I love my work so much is because we've got a whole lot of work still to do with helping people from all walks of life fulfill their financial potential. And so that's why I'm here today to talk to you. A lot of the clients who choose to step into my private coaching programs are physicians, engineers who have you know, between 15 and 20 years of experience, sometimes more than that, sometimes less, but they are very experienced in their fields. And often they have bumped up against glass ceilings. They're working, working hard to recover from burnout and have kind of had the sense of their career stalling out. Remember when you were young and just getting started, how the career just stepped, just kept on kind of climbing like this. And all of a sudden you kind of plateaued. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is, of course, burnout. Um, another is because just because life gets in the way sometimes. And sometimes it seems like the, um, the road gets narrow, narrower. So even if you've got high aspirations, sometimes it can feel really tough to find that next level position. And that's what I help people with. That's the hill. Um, I learned this from one of my, my colleagues years ago, she said she was going into uh, negotiations for something. And she said, she said, you have to pick the hill you're going to die on. And this is a hill I don't have to die on because I know I can take every single time. And that is helping high achieving, bright, intelligent, emotionally intelligent people achieve their next level, their next level positions, um, get their salary raises and promotions and start getting paid what they're worth. So um, if that lands for you, you're in the right place. And those of you who are joining me live, hello, hello. Good to see you here. If you've got a question or something that you want me to specifically address during this session today, I'm happy to do that. Just pop that in the comments and we're going to go ahead and dive in. So I took some notes. I think that anytime we talk about money, it's going to kick up some issues in our tissues. And today I expect won't be an exception to that, but I do want us to just kind of notice and pay attention to the energy or the, the emotions that you might be feeling even as you're listening to this, to this session today. Sometimes when we're going for a promotion or we want a promotion or we think we deserve a promotion, there, there can be the sense of, I'm going to use the word entitlement, and I don't mean that in a privileged way, but more like, I've worked really hard. Um, I deserve it. Other people are getting raises and promotions and why am I not? And that sort of thing. So there can be this sort of dissonance internally that creates sometimes confusion. And at, if not confusion, at least a drag in terms of the psychology of making more money. Oh my goodness, from Newfoundland. We've got Gail from Newfoundland here. How fun is that? Welcome, welcome, Gail. All right, so let me take a look here at my notes here today. So the first thing I wanna talk about 
I actually want to start with the story. Um, there was, there have been several actually women who have worked with me, and this is kind of a composite sketch from their experiences as, as they went through this process. But often women will come in feeling burned out, feeling frustrated, feeling like they're not fulfilling their intellectual potential or their career potential, not to mention their financial potential. And there's frustration involved there. I've said recently that in order for us to be self-actualized, in order for us to fulfill our heart's desires, we really have to bring money into the conversation because money is actually required to fulfill our heart's desires. And if we can't just have the conversation around financial compensation, if we can't in a, in a situation like this, how can we expect ourselves to be self-actualized in any area of our lives? Of course, you can reach a certain level of self-actualization with just enough money, but I really believe we've reached a, a time in our lives, especially for women, especially for people of color, where it's time to fulfill the financial potential as well. So there can be some frustration coming into these conversations and this work that we do around the psychology of making money. And it's understandable. In fact, what I have found is that we have to look at when we're looking at expanding your capacity to hold more money, to receive more money, to ask for more money. When we look at that, we have to look at societal, cultural, generational, genetic, and even soul level influences that might be creating stories for you about, about your specific relationship and interaction with money. It could be something as simple as, well, money's for other people, but not for me. Or you could say, I just need enough to get by. I just need enough to pay all of my bills. Um, we have to look at, when we're looking at social and cultural messaging, a lot of, it's interesting, a lot of the people who come in and work with me are doing very well in their careers. They are in, you know, they're in the, in the executive suite. They have really made a lot of themselves, especially they will say from where they came from. We look at a lot of people rising out of low income families. We see a lot of people who come, whose parents were teachers and blue collar workers and things like that, who have really risen into these leadership positions in our organizations. And even they will say that at least I don't have to do this thing over here. I have so much money already. Why do I even need any more? But here's what I believe about that is that when we, when it comes to money, I want money in the hands of good people because when money is in the hands of good people, we make good choices. We make good decisions about how that money is, is spent, is used, is invested and so on. And it really changes the, the conversation and the energy and the, and the power dynamics actually as well of this world, which is what we're all going for anyway, I believe. So we have to first look at what's the story you're telling yourself about money. I mentioned some of these things already, but I want to come back to them just to kind of tick through them. One is you could be telling yourself, I have so much already. Why should I need or want anything else? Um, I should be happy with what I get. I don't need that much more to live. I just want to be comfortable. I, oh, and here's a good one, especially for women in leadership. I shouldn't have to ask. They should just know that I want to earn more money. They should just know. But here's the thing. Here's the thing about salaries, getting salary increases, promotions, negotiating, is that when it comes to your negotiations, nobody's gonna negotiate on your behalf except for you. That's the time in a relationship between a person and the organization where your boss, where the director, where the person, the decision maker is actually gonna be negotiating against you. Now, that's not to say that there aren't good people who want the best for you, I'm not saying that at all, but Really at the, the bottom line here is that these, these are opportunities for you to stand up for yourself and to negotiate for yourself. And I think that's a really good thing, but it's also very hard to do sometimes, especially when you've been 
from the time you were a little kid taught that, well, if you just work hard and keep your nose to the grindstone, that somebody's going to notice and give you your gold star, or give you your award or give you your raise or your promotion. And unfortunately, we know this, but it just bears repeating. We know that that's not always the case. Hard work doesn't necessarily equate to more money. In fact, I have a friend who says that if hard work were the basis of becoming wealthy, we'd all be gazillionaires because so many of us work so hard. And yet the, the money doesn't always show up as a result of the hard work. So there's a mismatch there that we have to, we have to address. And we do that. There are a lot of layers to addressing that mismatch between your effort and your compensation. But one of the ways that I like to look at it is just that internal, what, what are the stories I'm telling myself about my right to make money, my, my desire to make more money? What, what am I telling myself about that? That's a story that you have some control over. And that's a story that you can actually shift. What I find when you shift the inner story, the outer experience is going to change because it can't help it. Your perspective has changed. So that's what we really want to do as we're looking at the stories that you're telling yourself about money. Where do we need to shift that for you? What, what stories came through from your mom or your dad or the people who raised you? I, you know, there's one in, in America that we say, and maybe this is true elsewhere in the world too, but I always heard when I was a kid, money doesn't grow on trees. Well, money doesn't grow on trees. And um, that, that gets embedded in our systems. Money's not abundant. I have a lime tree in my backyard that is prolific. And I always think if those limes were money, Money would be falling from the trees. You know, there's something to that. There is an abundance of, of money in the world. There is an abundance of, of goodness in the world. We just have to be able to clear out any of those old stories that might be obscuring our perspective from seeing it. So along with looking at money stories from your, from your history, looking at shifting perspective around your money stories, really, we also have to look at a couple of elements that I'd like to check in with you on today, just for your own information. So there are two, we have to look at your sense of worthiness and we have to look at your sense of deservedness. And usually there can be a mismatch. So you can feel very worthy of receiving more money, but you may not feel like you deserve it. And the reverse is true. You can feel like you deserve it, but you don't feel worthy of it. So let's just do that. Let's workshop that right now for you on a scale of one to 10. When you think about getting a raise, a promotion, a salary increase, having a windfall of some kind, getting a bonus that was unexpected, having a new client step into a program, if you're, if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, Right. So what's the level of deservedness on a on a scale of one to ten? And what's the level of worthiness on a scale of one to ten? Most people, when they begin this work, usually fall, you know, about four, five, six, something like that. Sometimes we've got a great sense of deservedness and a great sense of worthiness. And if that's you, that's wonderful. And that's something that's something that we see as a sweet spot in terms of being able to ask and receive what you desire. But for many people, when you're sitting at like a four or five or a six on worthiness or deservedness, it just tells us that we've got some work to do around shifting your perspective internally about healing some of those old stories and perhaps even some of the old traumas about whether or not you're worthy and deserving. Because after all, if not you, who? If not you, who? So I mentioned earlier, we need to take a look at the generational, genetic, societal, and cultural pieces of the, of the financial compensation puzzle. And that's especially important. If you're a first or second generation college graduate, so if you, your family history is one of blue collar workers, or if you're an immigrant yourself, these are the places, or if your family are immigrants, these are the, these are the opportunities that you have to really examine what were the messages that I received 
from my immigrant parents about making money. The, sometimes the making money thing, I, and I find this especially with people who have, who have done well for themselves, but come from backgrounds that are, that are lower income, that come from families with blue collar workers and so on. Um, sometimes there's a guilt factor as well. Sometimes there's a sense of over responsibility to the family as well. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with being risk financially responsible for other people, but it can, it can play a, it can play a game with your psychology as you're leaning into making more money, asking for more money. So I just want you to be aware of that as well. And we also, the next thing I want us to look at is looking at your receiving muscles. What does that even mean? What's a receiving muscle, Robin? I've never heard of that before. Well, it's your capacity to receive anything, anything positive, receive a compliment. Can you receive a compliment without turning it into an explanation? Can you just say, thank you? Can you receive more money? Are you set up to receive more money? Or do you have the guard at the gate saying, oh, I don't know if I deserve that. And oftentimes what happens when people have a, have a wonky relationship with receiving is that even if they do receive money into their bank accounts, receive money into their lives, they'll spend it. They'll treat it like a hot potato and spend it as fast as they can. Or there will be, you know, emergency that comes up that they just happen to have the exact need exactly about the amount of money that they just received to pay for whatever that emergency was. So look at your receiving muscle and on a scale of one to 10, how's your receiving muscle doing? How good are you at receiving? How good are you, are, are you at receiving more oxygen in your body? How good at you are taking deep breaths? How good at, are you at receiving positive feedback? How good at you, are you at receiving acknowledgements or awards? And this is something that when I think about a story from somebody who's worked with me, I remember someone who came to me and I mean, her CV was incredible. The projects that she had worked on, the literally billions of dollars in projects she had worked on in her career and the awards that she had won were really remarkable. In fact, I was at a place in my career where I was like, why does she wanna work with me? And that I had some work to do around my own receiving muscles. But when I sat down to start working with her, what she told me was that all of those awards, all of those accolades, all of those accomplishments felt like they belonged to somebody else. She hadn't internalized them, she hadn't embodied them. And so part of her journey to the C-suite actually was to embody those accomplishments because the world would tell you, don't get too big for your britches. The world would tell you, don't brag because you'll make somebody else feel bad. But what if all of those accomplishments and all of those awards and all of those, those high achievements that you have, that you have achieved what if those are meant to be foundational to this next level that you're going into? What if you, you can't pass go, you can't collect $200 unless and until you're able to embody what you've already accomplished? And by embody, I just mean take it inside of you, own it. You don't have to be braggalicious about it, but you can just be proud of yourself. And I don't talk about pride in the egoic perspective. I talk about it in like the spiritual perspective of, yes, I did that. Yes. And Gail, I just saw your question. So when we're getting toward the end, I'll answer that because that's a really good question about um, when you're asked, when you're asked to do something and they're asked for what your rate is. Um, I talk about that a lot in my corporate client attraction work that I do with, um, 
with entrepreneurs and business owners. So we'll chat about that in just a second. So we have to look at receiving muscles and we also have to look at your holding muscles, your capacity to hold with comfort greater and greater sums of money. Have you ever gotten a bonus or a, a big cash infusion into your bank accounts? It can kind of feel wobbly and you can kind of look around like, oh, what do I do with this? How do I do this? What do I do? And so, you know, the automatic response is, well, I'll save it, I'll invest it, whatever, I'll pay off some bills, whatever. But we have to, if you're not paying attention, you're going to move into that place of who me? Do I even deserve this? Who me? Am I even worthy of this? And even if you have the money, you can create conditions for that money to flow out like as fast as it's come in. If you're not paying attention to your capacity to hold and to just let it be with you. Is this making sense? So by the way, I know if you're here, if you raised your hand for, for this session, there's a good chance that you might want some support on this. And if this is something you do want some support on, why don't you go ahead and book a call with me so we can have a conversation about what's going on with you. And if I feel like I can help you, I'll make some recommendations on how we can work together. You can go to drrobinmckay.com forward slash call and just get on my calendar and we can have a private conversation about your specifics because you know when I when I do these sessions there are generalizations and there are things that I can speak broadly to but to really tune into what's going on for you I need to have the conversation with you so you're welcome you're welcome to get on my calendar and let's have a conversation about that or if you want me to come in and talk with your women's group or any other special interest group in your organization to have these conversations around the psychology of making money, let's do that. And you can do the same thing. Just book a call with me and we'll talk about the specifics. DrRobinMcKay.com forward slash call. All right. Okay. So as we are closing today, there are a couple of things that I want us to think about. I want us to think about the fact that money touches every aspect of our lives. And the stats may have changed a little bit, but I remember in probably 2011, so 10 years, 10 or so years ago, the World Bank came out with some stats that indicated that women make up about 50% of the workforce in the world, but only hold 1% of the wealth. That in and of itself is a foundational reason to make the shift so that you can receive and hold more money. And I find that for women and for people of color um, who, are, who are wanting to lean into making more money, sometimes it's not about wanting. Of course you want it. There are other factors that play a role in your capacity to lean into it. So I wanna, I wanna end with this. There are two things that I always talk to my private clients about when it comes to negotiating. One is that if you're worried about negotiating, you're worried about somebody saying no to you or being mad at you. That's something that needs to be addressed behind the scenes so that you can go into your negotiations fearlessly. And you have to be willing to walk away from it as well. You have to be willing to say yes or no to the negotiation. If you are too attached to it, and Gail, this is a great time to bring up your question. I will just read it so, so that everyone can, can hear what you're asking. She says, I've been asked by a charity to develop a short customized training. The representative has asked for my charity rate. It's my first international work and not quite sure how to respond. Well, congratulations on getting the opportunity for your first international work. That is awesome. And what I will say is this, that when you don't know how to respond or you're worried about responding, it's usually because you're attached to outcome. So I learned this a long time ago from Kendall Summerhawk way back in the day when I first started my work in entrepreneurship. And she said, treat your negotiations, treat your pricing like you're asking to pass the salt. So just in a very neutral energy, 
pass the salt. And when you treat your negotiation like it's a pass the salt moment, I mean, the salt is required. Don't get me wrong. But when you ask for it in such a common, in a, such an ordinary way, in such a, a neutral way, it takes all of the charge out of it. So neutralize your emotions. You don't have to feel positive necessarily about negotiating. Negotiating is challenging, but you can feel neutral about it. So just bring yourself into neutral. Second is that Sheryl Sandberg said this years ago when she was negotiating her own position at Facebook. I know she's left, but I think this is such a good teaching point. She, there's a video of her talking about receiving this offer from Zuck at Facebook to come and work for the company as a COO. And she was very excited about it. And she said in her interview, she said, I felt so grateful. It was so much money. And I felt like that was so perfect. And she said, my husband, she said her husband and her, I think her brother-in-law said, you have to negotiate. And she was like, why? This is a really good, this is a really good offer. And they said, well, a man would negotiate. So that's number one. And the other thing that she said was when she stepped into negotiations, she said that she told Zuck, she said, this is the only time that you and I will be on the opposite sides of the negotiating table. I know you're going to want a COO who knows how to negotiate. And so I'm going to be negotiating for myself. So, or something like that, I'm paraphrasing. But the idea here is that, as I said in the beginning, no one's going to negotiate for you better than you or accept for you. You have to stand up for yourself and stand up for, for who you are and what you have to offer and what you are meant to be contributing rather than waiting for somebody to give you the green light or the go ahead to do so. You have to give yourself the green light. Um, and in so doing, when you neutralize your emotions over your asks, when you set your intention of the end better, you put yourself in the, in the emotional driver's seat to be able to say yes or no to their response. And there's freedom there. So when it comes to something like what Gail, you're asking after is what, how do I respond to this, this ask for my, my charity rate? Here's what I do. So I'm just going to give you an example from my real life. My favorite, favorite nonprofit is the Society of Women Engineers. I've worked with that organization literally for years. Um, they, I just, I love them. I love the women engineers. I know them. I grew up with them. They're my, they're my people. So um, I have rates for nonprofits and I have corporate rates. Here's how I position it. When I'm working with somebody like the Society of Eng Women Engineers and they come and they say, hey, doc, can you do a talk on, let's say this topic, let's say we're doing salary negotiations, raises and promotions. Can you come in and do a talk? I'll say, yes, I can. And then I'll say, here are my rates. If I were to come in and do this in a, my corporate rate is X. My corporate rate is 7,500. Um, but, you know, I, I adore you guys and I want to work with you and I want to make it work with your budget. And so then I'll give the rate that usually works for them, which is around a thousand dollars. I'm happy to do that because often there are women engineers in those programs who need to hear me speak, who need to have eye to eye, heart to heart contact with me and end up hiring me either for themselves or they end up inviting me into their own organizations to work with their people. So it's a win-win, but I stay unattached and I always come from the perspective and I want us to have a long relationship and I want this to be a win-win for both of us. So what's your budget? And I'm happy to work with you on your budget. All right. So that's kind of a general sense of it. There's a whole lot more to it, Gail. And as I mentioned, I work a lot with entrepreneurs and business owners on that piece of the puzzle in my corporate client attraction um, programs that actually obviously can be applied to the, the nonprofit world as well. So I hope that helped you. Good luck with that. Let us know how that goes for you. And let me just tune in and see if there's anything else. 
I just think that where we are in the world right now, women, people of color, people who are not of the majority culture, uh, this is our time to rise into fulfilling our financial potential as well so that we can have peace of mind in our own lives so that we can make different decisions so that we can have the freedom that we desire to have for ourselves. And so that we can start fulfilling our heart's desires and leaning into our own highest potential. To do that, we have to clear out some of the psychology and some of the energetics that have been in place for literally generations about how people are meant to be making money. I've said for a long time, we have to recalibrate our relationship with time, with money, and with work. Because this dollars for hour exchange no longer applies. And yet, and yet, we continue to have that, I'll call it a program, running through our system grids every single day to exchange dollars for hours. But I know how to extract that particular program. I know how to upload new software for you so that you can have a different experience with work, with money, and even with time as well. All right, so that's enough for today. Thank you so much for coming to our Tuesday morning meeting. Again, if you would like to have a private conversation with me, just get yourself on my calendar, drrobinmckay.com forward slash call. We'll put that in the show notes. And I will look forward to speaking with you privately. Until next time, have a great week.